Well, guys, it is great to see you today. It's great being with you on this very rainy day and the fact that you made it to church. I'm so proud of you guys. This is awesome, right? And so again, uh, it's great to be with you. I want to welcome you. I want to welcome those of you watching or listening online as well, because today, as you just saw, we're kicking off such an exciting and such an impactful series called Fully Alive. And today to kind of start our timer to get us thinking, I'm going to need your participation. And so I'm going to ask a question. And if you agree to this, I'd love you just to raise your hand and let me know you're kind of with, with me or that you would agree to this question. And if you're here today or you're watching online and you're an introvert, this is going to make you super uncomfortable. So I just want to kind of warn you, right? But here's the question. This is an important one. And I want you to think for yourself. So just for you personally, think about this. Do you in your life, do you want to be fully alive? Is that something that you guys want in your life? Just raise your hand if you do. And I think I see most of your hands. A couple I didn't see your hands, which if, if you don't want to live fully alive, then the next five weeks is going to be super boring for you. So I just want to give you a heads up there because this is what we're going to be talking about. Over the next five weeks, we're, we're actually going to be asking and answering this question is, is it possible in your life and in my life, is it possible to live a life that's fully alive? So as we think about this concept of living our lives, you know, fully alive lives, I want you to think about it this way. I want you to think about your life, right? So think about your life. Think about your relationships. Think about your kind of emotional state right now and just the way that you feel. And as you think about your life, I want, I want you kind of to rate your life or think about your life on this line. And on this line, on one side, we have a zero, and the zero represents basically as bad as life can get. So think about this. I mean, this is like relationships are all kind of pretty much in shambles. This is in terms of, you know, your job or with school, you can't stand it. It just feels like you're really suffering. This really feels like, you know, your, your favorite sports team continues to lose. And you're like, are you kidding me? You know, this is your kind of emotional internal disposition to go, you know what? For the most part, I feel like I'm underwater. For the most part, I feel like I can't, uh, you know, uh, breathe. For the most part, I feel like I've kind of lost hope in life. I mean, just think about this. You, we could go on and on, but the zero represents that this is as bad as it can get. Now, on the other side over here, this would be 10 and 10 would be the opposite. 10 would say, this is as good as life can get. This is my favorite sports team keeps winning and it's awesome, right? This is my relationships, you know, aren't perfect, but I'm able to navigate the ups and downs and learn from those relationships and not try to be defensive, but I continue to learn in those relationships and really benefit from those. This is your internal disposition saying, you know what? I feel emotionally healthy. You know, I, I'm able to, to hear things. I'm able to receive feedback. I'm not defensive when people like push on me. You know, I, I'm able to really learn and to listen in life. And my identity, I feel secure. I feel this sense of worth. I feel this sense of value. Like this is basically as good as life gets. So my question for you is, as you think about your life on this you know, kind of spectrum, and here's our midpoint right here. As you think about your life personally, this is just between you and you. What would be your number? What's your number in terms of where you would kind of rate where you're at today? Is it a two? A five? Is it a 10? Like what would be your number? Now, as you think about that, I'm going to share with you my number because I've been thinking about this this week. And as I thought about, you know, everything going on in my life, I would say I'm probably right here that I would be a seven. I feel pretty good about that. And the reason why I would say I'm a seven is because as I think about, you know, my family, as I think about my five sons, you know, it's awesome to have five sons and my relationship with them right now and their ability to actually talk to them. And like, I can, I can talk to them right now. And that's awesome. So that kind of puts me over here. But the fact that three of my five sons are teenagers kind of puts me over here, right? <laughs> Because I mean, you know, teenager or especially sons are like discovering masculinity and how strong am I and pushing all the boundaries, right? And all that's happening right now, which makes it a little bit harder. But then not only that, but I think about my relationship with Jill, my beautiful wife. And, you know, I just think about who she is. And she's a remarkable woman. She's a remarkable mom. And she's a remarkable wife. And not that we don't have our ups and downs and we kind of, you know, learn a lot and we've been in counseling a long time and we've worked really, really hard. We've discovered a lot of things about ourselves. But, you know, I, I would say, you know, I'm probably about a seven. And, and as I think about my, my personal, you know, my, my personal like well-being, you know, how I feel on pretty much a consistent basis, 
You know, I've shared with you guys that I've been in counseling for a long, long time. And counseling's not a crutch. Counseling, I think, is brilliant. It's just a mirror that I get to look in on a weekly basis or every other week that I go, oh, that's what's going on. And that's that feeling. And that's why I feel that way. And, oh, and that's where it came from. I had no idea that's where it came from. And the benefit of that is I don't put that on my sons. I don't put that on my wife. I don't put that on you guys because I'm aware of what's happening. Now, I haven't arrived by any means. I've got a lot of work to do, internal work. But as I think about that, as I think about my whole life, I think I'm about a seven. And, and, and one of the other reasons I think, you know, in terms of seven is because of this. It's the Longhorns. And, uh, and right now, this really pushes my number way back here. Because when I think about Maryland, like we've lost two years in a row. Are you kidding me? And then, no disrespect, but Tulsa Golden Hurricanes... It's like a high school team, and we barely won. I was like, are you kidding me? So that pushes me way over here. But my point being, at the end of the day, I would say I'm about a seven. So back to you, back to you, giving you a little bit of time to think about your number. In your life, what's your number? Where would you rate your life? And to give a little bit more context, I, I would say when, when I'm talking about a zero, I would describe it as fully dead. It's a pretty hard term, but you know, that would be zero. That would say, hey, you know, I just feel completely dead. Now on the, on the other side of this is I would say a 10 would be fully alive. And that's what we're talking about, fully alive. And then I would say if you're anywhere between zero and 10, and this may seem a little bit harsh, but I would say that is partially dead if that D can stretch out a little bit. <laughs> and, and again, I would say if you're anywhere here between zero and 10, if you're two, if you're five, if you're seven, there, there's part of you that's dead. And, and the question is this, is, is it possible in your life and in my life, is it possible to be fully alive? Is it possible to move from a two to a 10? Is it possible to move from a five to a 10? Is it possible to experience a life, not just a moment, but a life that's fully alive? You see, I think for some of you, you the optimist in the room, you would say, of course it is. Like, I look forward to that. I think it's possible to live at a 10, to be fully alive. But I think for others in the room, perhaps if you're a little bit more pessimistic or you know, depending how you see that glass, half full, half empty, You'd say, well, Buck, I've lived enough life. I've experienced enough betrayal, enough hurt, enough pain, uh, just enough life to say, I don't think it's possible. I really don't think you can live a life fully alive. So wherever you're at on that kind of spectrum, the good news is this, and the reason why we're doing this series is this, is that I think there is a way. I think there is a pathway to actually live a life that's fully alive. And guys, that's what we're gonna be talking about over the next five weeks. Now, as we think about this concept in your life and my life of being fully alive, I think it's really important before we go a little bit deeper to talk about what I would say is the number one misconception. Because I would say the number one misconception when it comes to being fully alive is this, is that we associate momentary feelings with a fully alive life. This is a misconception. And let me try to explain or let me try to illustrate. For example, think about this. A few years ago, I was in Vegas. And perhaps your question is, can my pastor be in Vegas? And the answer is, of course I can, right? Now, Paul was in Corinth. I can go to Vegas. Anyways, another discussion. So Jill and I were in Vegas, and, and I love to play blackjack. I, you know, it's just it's my thing. And so while well, I was playing blackjack, and I got a hand in blackjack. It was two eights. And anytime you have two eights, you know, kind of the, the basic strategy is to split those eights. And so I split the eights, and then I got another eight. And now I have three eights, so I have three hands here. And it wasn't a substantial amount of money, but I was like, oh, you know, this is kind of risky. And, you know, I had three bets going. And then they laid, you know, one card after another after another. And then the dealer flips their card over and they've got a 14. And so this was this moment. I'm, I'm so nervous. And I'm like, what's about to happen? You know, what's going to? And they flipped the card over and the dealer busted. And in that moment, there was just this kind of overwhelming feeling that came over, like celebration, kind of this euphoric feeling. I was like, yes, this is awesome. And I remember I took, you know, my winnings from the table. I just said, it's time to walk away. And I walked away. And as I was walking away, I'm not kidding. This little thought hit me. And the little thought said, wow, 
that felt so alive. That felt so incredibly good. That's that momentary feeling. And that's the feeling we get when, you know, we pursue a certain job and you get the job or you make the team in school and now you're starting or you get into that certain school or you close that big deal that you've been working and working and working and working and finally you close the deal and you see what it did to your bank account. And you're like, yes, that feels awesome. That's that feeling we get in a relationship when we ask him or ask her out and we so desire to be with them and they say yes. And that feeling you get, especially during the first few months of that relationship, you know, what's fascinating, this is kind of a side point, what, what's fascinating in the honeymoon phase of a relationship is that today we can scan brains and we understand the activity of what's happening in a brain, you know, in that honeymoon phase. And what they've done, they've been able to scan a brain in a relational honeymoon phase and they've scanned a brain and kind of put it side by side on cocaine. And the brain in a honeymoon phase of a relationship is actually higher than a brain on cocaine that there is this euphoric feeling, this like, oh, she is my soulmate. We'll spend the rest of our lives together. And I love it. It's the same thing we get with high risk you know, maneuvers, like high risk behaviors. Like when you were five, you jumped off the chair because you were like, woo, I'm going to get wild. When you were like 10, you jumped off the roof. And then in your teenage years, you had to jump out of the plane because you had to keep, you had to keep getting up. You know, the feeling had to keep growing and growing. And then in your 20s, you strapped a parachute on and, and jumped off a cliff because it just made you feel alive. And we so want to feel alive in those momentary feelings. And that's also true when it comes to morality. I mean, I, we're, we're all adults here. We can talk about this. I mean, isn't it true when it comes to those moral lines? Where God said, hey, kiddo, trust me, with that substance or with those kind of actions or those choices that God said to you and to me, would you just trust me? I'm your heavenly father. I love you. I am for you. I'm not trying to oppress you. I am actually trying to free you and liberate you. And it's those lines that we want to cross. And isn't it true the tricky part about morality is when you cross that line, it feels pretty good. When you cross that line and taste and experience what you so desire, it feels amazing. And you're like, this is great. And perhaps one of the whispers is maybe the whisper that I had is this feels so alive, but it's momentary. And the misconception is this, we associate momentary feelings with a fully alive life. And it's important to understand that because of this truth here, because chasing momentary feelings to feel alive will eventually make you feel partially or fully dead. I mean, we, we have been chasing feelings our whole life. I want to feel good. I want to feel happy. I want to feel alive. So I'm going to pursue the what? I'm going to take that risk. And the feelings, the older you get, isn't this true that the feelings grow? The risk has to grow as well. And that we get older and older and we just chase these feelings, but they're momentary. They're fleeting. They're here today and gone tomorrow. Here today or gone in a week or gone in a month or gone in a year. And then we got to kind of raise the risk a little bit more, accomplish it a little bit more, pursue the what? a little bit more, but the challenge is they're fleeting. They're momentary. And, and I could give you so many different examples of this just in our everyday life. But think about this. Think about this individual. His name is Boris Becker. Boris Becker, if you're old enough and lived in the 80s, you know that he was kind of a phenom. I mean, he was like this, you know, in the 80s, the number one tennis player in the world. And he won the Wimbledon and, 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 you know, it's just amazing. And he had everything you could imagine a person having. He got to the pinnacle of everything. And the day after he won the Wimbledon, the day after he was interviewed and the interviewer was shocked because the interviewer asked, Hey, you've won, you know, the Wimbledon is awesome. And so tell me how you feel. Have you accomplished in life? Do you feel like fully alive? And Boris, his res response was my greatest challenge today is not committing suicide. And he went on to explain because, hey, it gave me that feeling of fully alive. I thought the pinnacle of winning that championship would deliver, but it's failed to sustain. And here I am again wanting more and more and more. It's not only true with Boris, but it's also true with Tom Brady. I mean, Tom Brady, I mean, he's, he's people call him the GOAT, right? The greatest of all time in terms of quarterbacks. There's a great argument for that. 
But I mean, Tom Brady, after he won three Super Bowls, which is just unheard of, a human being, a quarterback in the NFL, winning three Super Bowls, such a rare thing. You would think at this point in his life, he would be accomplished. At this point in his life, you would think, hey, you are at the pinnacle. You are fully alive, Tom. And in a 60-minute interview, that was the question. Because very few human beings have ever gotten to the pinnacle like Tom. So the question is, look at all you have and look at all your fame and notoriety and three Super Bowls, Tom. Tell us how it feels. Is this true? And Tom's response in the 60-minute interview was, gosh, I wish. Gosh, I wish. But there's got to be something more. It's momentary. It's fleeting. And perhaps this explains so many addictions that we, have, that we face. Perhaps this explains why there's, you know, a second marriage and a third marriage and a fourth marriage because he's not doing it for me any longer. She's not doing it for me any longer. Perhaps this explains why we say to our kids, you know, hey, hey, kiddo, you know, I got to go again. I got to go again. I got to go again. I got to climb the ladder. I got to climb the ladder. This is really for you. And, and I don't deny that. I don't deny that we work hard for our kids to give them something better than we had. But in that brutally honest moment, is that really what it's about? Or is it about chasing that feeling, getting that title, making that amount of money, starting that kind of company? Because I want to feel alive. You know, one of the greatest quotes that I think summarizes this is from a gentleman by the name of Ravi Zacharias, great author, great thinker. He says, the loneliest moment in life is when you have just experienced that which you thought would deliver the ultimate. And it is just let you down. That's what we do in our lives. Because I think we want this in our lives. So we chase the what, we chase the feeling. But it's momentary. So what do we do with that? Well, the good news is that there is another way. There is another pathway. In fact, in John chapter 10, John speaks directly into our conversation. In fact, in John 10, it's a story about Jesus and Jesus talking to a crowd. And Jesus says something in this conversation that is so profound and so incredibly helpful for your life and for mine. And, and the context of what's happening in John 10 is, is that Jesus is talking to this large crowd. So imagine, you know, massive crowd. And in the crowd are Jesus' disciples. So he's got his 12 guys with him, you know. And, and in the crowd are the religious leaders called the Pharisees. And Jesus is just kind of poking at the Pharisees. And, and as you read the teachings of Jesus, one of the most unique things is he was incredibly hard and harsh publicly on the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day. I mean, Jesus would call the Pharisees publicly. He would call them snakes. He'd go, hey, guys, I just want you to know that group of people right there, a bunch of snakes. He would call them whitewashed tombs publicly and say, hey, they look fantastic on the outside, but they're dead on the inside. Because he could see their hypocrisy. He could see the pain that they were causing in women and children and families because of how they were misleading them. He could see that they were leveraging their power for their benefit, not for the benefit of the people. And so on this occasion in John 10, Jesus was having the discussion with the religious leaders being hard. And he said, you guys are blind. You're misleading these people again. And it's coming not at the cost of you. It's coming at the cost of the people. And then Jesus transitions and he says, let me tell you a story. So he's talking to the Pharisees, the whole crowd's listening. He goes, let me tell you a story. And he makes up this story called a parable, which is a made up story to make a point. And that's where we jump into the conversation. Here's what he says. He says, very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, these are the religious leaders. He says, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. To which you, you read that and you're like, Jesus, what's that have to do with this? <laughs> like, what, what, where's this going? And Jesus, I mean, what is this all about? Well, again, this is a parable. It's a made up story to make a point. But I'm telling you in the crowd, everybody understood what Jesus said here. See, in our culture, you know, we've got highways and internet and Apple devices and all this stuff. In their culture, it was an agrarian culture to where they would walk down the street and they would see, you know, Frank's farm and John's farm. And that was just their culture. They would see all this livestock and cattle and sheep and the whole thing. They, that was the culture they lived in. So they all understood what Jesus was saying. They had all seen a sheep, or a sheep pen and how that has high walls on the sheep pen and the gate of a sheep pen. And they all understood the only legitimate way to enter into a sheep pen is through the gate. 
that if you try to climb the wall or go over the wall, everyone know, would know that you are a thief, that you are a robber, that you don't have the best interest of the sheep in mind. And everybody listening to Jesus also understood that sheep trust the shepherd, that sheep understand the shepherd's voice. They know the shepherd's voice. They know the shepherd has their best interest in mind. So everybody listening to this is going, okay, we got this, Jesus. I'm not sure where you're going, but we've all seen this. And then Jesus continues and he says this. He says, the, gate, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Now, again, this is so remarkable because what Jesus is saying here, and the whole crowd understood this because they've seen it. The whole crowd understood that you don't have to herd sheep. Like you got to herd cattle and get your horses and you know, bring them all in. With a sheep, a sheep knows the shepherd's voice. All the shepherd had to do was walk in front of the sheep and talk and the sheep would follow his voice. The shepherd had such an intimate relationship with the sheep. The shepherd protected the sheep. The shepherd tr or the sheep trusted the shepherd everywhere he went. And if a stranger came in and tried to call the sheep, they would never come. They would only come to the shepherd's voice. And the shepherd knew the sheep by name. That's the kind of relationship the shepherd would have with the sheep. So everybody's hearing Jesus and they're like, okay, Jesus, I got, we've seen this. Like shepherds walk in front of the sheep. You don't have to hurt them. We've seen sheep pen and the gates and the whole thing. Jesus, what's your point? And he says, I'll tell you. And he says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. In other words, Jesus says, guys, the number one reason I'm here is for you to be saved. And the question is, saved from what? And the answer to that is saved from our sin. That your sin and my sin is the obstacle to our peace with God. That the, 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 re, you know, the reason we don't have peace with God is because of our sin. And so Jesus sees that. And because he loves you and loves me, comes into this world, lives a perfect life. So he could be a perfect sacrifice to satisfy the perfect justice of God, which God is perfectly just. Somebody must deal with my sin. Somebody must deal with your sin. Jesus says, I'll deal with it. Be a perfect sacrifice. Satisfy the justice of God and pay for your sin, past, present, and future, so you can have peace with God so you can be saved from your sins so that you can know your eternity is secure in heaven. That's the major reason why Jesus came. But then he gave us an indicator. He said something more. He said, they will come in and go out and find pasture. In other words, when, when people trust and come to me in the ups and downs of life, when they trust and come to the gate and come through the gate, which is Jesus Christ, they'll find pasture. And see, when sheep would find pasture, the idea is that a sheep in a pasture, that's where they would be fed. That's where they would be nourished. That's where they would feel a sense of freedom. That's where they'd see this sense of adventure. That's where comfort was found. It's in the pasture because the shepherd would be with the sheep in the pasture. And Jesus says, that's available to you and to me. And then he summarizes the whole thing and look at what he says. He says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So Jesus, why'd you come? Well, the number one thing I came was to remove the obstacle to your peace with God, to remove sin, to pay for your sin so you could have peace with God. Well, what do we do after that? Do we just hold hands and sing kumbaya and do nothing in this life? No, 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 no. I have something for you in this life. What I have for you is a pasture. What I have for you is to live life and to live it to the full. But it comes through me. It comes through the gate. And what's remarkable is, is you read the scriptures, you read the Bible, and you look at all the places where Jesus talks about what he has for you. I mean, Jesus isn't all about like, hey, you must, you know, believe in me, and then you're saved, and then you go to heaven. And that's, that, I mean, he's, he's, he's about so much more than that. He says, hey, when you trust in me, not only are you forgiven, but I have something for you. And throughout scripture, here's the things that we see Jesus say over and over and over that there's salvation. You can have peace with God, legit. And your eternity can be secure, legit, through Christ. That not only that, though, but that you can have freedom. I mean, Jesus says, hey, here's the truth and the truth will set you free. We want freedom in life. Jesus says it's through the gate. 
that there's a sense of adventure. There's kindness and goodness and truth. I mean, Jesus said, hey, guys, come to me. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. That's what I have for you. The most important thing we can ever discover in life is truth. What is true? Jesus says, I am the truth. That we can experience life to the full, gentleness, happiness, rest, love, joy, peace, patience, self-control. That's what Jesus Christ has for you. That's what you find in the pasture. So, as we think about all of that, let me just ask a question. Where do you go and what do you do? In the valleys of life and in the peaks of life, in the hardships of life and in the success of life, what do you do? And where do you go? When you, that relationship goes south and there's betrayal and you feel the emotions associated with that and you are so hurt and you are so angry and the hope feels like it's fade, faded in life. When you get home, what do you do? Or where do you go with that? When you have this sense of just that you're underwater and you can't breathe in life because it feels like life is pressing in on every angle of you. And again, there's just a little to no hope. What, where do you go with that? What do you do? Or how about in the good times of life? When there's success and you're making more money than you've ever made. You're climbing the ladder and your titles and your office and your company and everything's going great. In the good times of life, where do you go? And what do you do? In your life, do you pursue the what? The momentary feeling? Is it like, hey, I've gotten home, nobody's home yet, so you know what I'm going to do? In kind of this depressed or angry or hurt or betrayed state? Or you know what? Hey, I'm going out because I just closed that big deal. Guess what I'm going to do? What are you going to pursue? What is the what? Do you go to the what in the highs and lows of life? Or you go to the person of Jesus Christ. See, not the concept, not the idea, not the religious kind of, you know, hey, say, you know, Jesus. No, Jesus is a real person. Do you go to the person of Jesus Christ? Did you pause long enough in life to hear the words of Jesus when he says, hey, all of you who are weary and heavy burden, come to me and you will find rest. Are you patient enough in the hardships of life? to wait and be patient with Jesus Christ, to give you rest, to allow you to experience a peace that truly transcends all understanding? Or do you want to control? Do you want to feel good now? And so you pursue the what? Where do you go with this naturally? What do you do? You know, as I, I thought about this myself, as I thought about my personal life, you know, in a very honest moment, I really struggle with this. I'm a driven kind of guy. I like control. And let me just tell you, I've struggled with this my entire life. You know, I thought this week from, you know, with this discussion, I thought, man, from the time I was a little boy, growing up in my home with my parents, and my parents, no disrespect to them, they did the best they could with the ingredients they had. But my parents were all about the what they were all about drive and success and what they could accomplish. And that was my parents, which meant on the other side of my parents, I grew up kind of in a chronic home of shame to where the idea was, it's not good enough. You're not good enough. You're inadequate. You got to get better. You better be better. And the only way I could ever get my parents' attention was by accomplishment. If I won two or three golf tournaments, then I would get their attention. If I did something extremely successful, then I would get their attention. And any time as a little boy, I tried to share my emotions, my feelings like, hey, here's the way I'm feeling right now. I'm really struggling with this. Or here's my opinions. It was met with the word, shut the hell up. Just shut the hell up. Because they were pursuing the what? They wanted to feel good themselves. And I was just getting in the way. And growing up at a home like that, in that kind of chronic state, guess what I wanted to feel? I wanted to feel alive. I wanted to feel listened to. I wanted to feel valuable enough to say, tell me more about that emotion. I wanted my mom to nurture me. I wanted to feel good. So what did I do? As a little boy, 
I began to push the boundaries and do things most other little boys wouldn't do to get people's attention. In my teenage years, my college years, I did everything the culture told me to do. You know, culture just says, hey, do whatever makes you happy. Oh, <laughs> be careful with that. But I did it. I did whatever I felt like doing because it was the what. And I crossed a lot of lines and I did a lot of things in life. And, and, and I, I think back on that and I think back upon my life. And what culture has said, I think back upon, you know, 42 years of life that God has given me. I think back on the hundreds and hundreds of conversations I've had on the other side of individuals who share some of the most intimate secrets with me to say, here's my life, just the role of a pastor. I hear these all the time. Here's what I've done in life. Here's what I've pursued in life. And I've heard so much about the what. And today, after 42 years, I'm more convinced than I've ever been in my life that you and I will not find a life that's fully alive in the what? It's momentary. The only place we can find that is in the person of Jesus Christ. So for you, in your life, in the lows of life and the highs of life, where do you go? Do you pursue the what? Or do you turn and invite the person of Jesus Christ to meet you? And if you're here today and you're a follower of Christ, you're a Christian, you've put your trust in Jesus Christ, or you're listening or watching online, perhaps you've forgotten your first love. Perhaps you've just gotten so busy in life and then you know, when you struggle or there's these emotions that happen or you know, these hardships or even the highs of life, these successes of life, perhaps you have been pursuing the what? And maybe today, maybe today, the only thing to take away, it's just a reminder that that's fleeting. It's momentary. And that a life fully alive is found in the person of Christ. And if you're here today or you're watching online and, and you're not a follower of Christ, I so respect the fact that you're here. I really do. And, and, and if you're not a follower of Christ, I think if you and I were just having coffee, you would agree and you would say, Buck, I totally get what you're saying because I have been pursuing the what my whole life. And the problem is, the longer I pursue it, the bar just keeps getting raised and keeps getting raised and I gotta risk more and I gotta risk more and it's fleeting and it's momentary. And it doesn't fully allow me to be alive. And so if you're here today and you're not a follower of Christ, what I would say to you is that, you know, Jesus Christ, he's knocking on the door of your heart. And Jesus is not going to force the door open. Jesus is not going to push it open and do that whole thing. Jesus will do everything possible to win you, do everything possible to show you how much you are valuable to him, how much he loves you, but he will not violate your free will. He won't. That's your choice. You have a choice to sit there or you have a choice to get up, unlock the door, and allow Jesus into your life. It's ultimately your choice. And my question, honestly, is, is what's keeping you from doing that? When it comes to the person of Jesus Christ, not all the other st stuff on the outside, but when it comes to the person of Jesus Christ, what's keeping you from getting up, unlocking the door, saying, Jesus, I, okay, I pursued everything else. I trust you are the one to allow me to be fully alive. What's stopping you from that? Because perhaps if you took the risk, perhaps if you put your trust in Christ, perhaps you would discover that there's a God who really loves you, that there's a God who knows your name, that there's a way to have a life and life to the full, that there's a way to have peace that does transcend all understanding, that there's a way to be comforted when you carry burdens and hardships of this life. So where do you go? If you're a follower of Christ, or if you're not, where do you go? Do you go to the what and to the feeling? Or do you go and patiently wait on the person of Jesus Christ? I want you to think about that.
Today, we're beginning this discussion. It's part one. And I know perhaps the tension is, how? How? How do I live fully alive? But today, all I wanted to do is lay the foundation and ask the question, are you willing? Are you willing to stop pursuing the what and the feeling and to pursue the person of Jesus Christ who promises to you and to me that where life and life to the full is found is through the gate, is through the person of Jesus Christ. Let me go ahead and pray for our time. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. Father, thank you for this discussion. It's such an important one for all of us. There are things you have for us. And I think you desire us to discover those. And so, Father, this is our attempt and our discussion that we're trying to discover what you have for us and what that looks like. So God, I just, I just pray that you meet all of us individually where we're at, that you open our eyes to the things that we need to open our eyes to, and that you ultimately just give us the wisdom and the courage to trust you, 
to trust the person of Jesus Christ. God, would you teach us what that looks like this week? In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, thanks so much for being here. I'll see you next week.